I'll start again. Uh, this is the um, second uh, seminar on the psychological interpretation of fairy tales. Uh, in the first seminar, um, I gave you some uh, impressions of why uh, Jungians are interested in fairy tales and interpreting fairy tales, studying fairy tales, reading them, uh, uh, even uh, uh, teaching them in our training institutes and subjecting our candidates to examinations on the interpretation of fairy tales. Um, and I brought uh, into the discussion last time the work of Mary Louise von Franz, who is the uh, noted Jungian expert on the interpretation of fairy tales. She wrote many books on the subject <clears throat> and is generally considered most outstanding and prolific author from a Jungian perspective on the interpretation of fairy tales. Today, I want to talk about Jung uh, as an interpreter of a fairy tale, uh, but also as the author of a fairy tale. To my knowledge, he interpreted only one fairy tale um, in any detail, at least, although he mentions fairy tales many times in his writings, but uh, in this uh, one essay that we will consider today, um, The Spirit Mercurius, uh, Jung interprets a fairy tale from the collection of the Brothers Grimm, German fairy tales collected by these uh, uh, two scholars uh, in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the, the title of that fairy tale is The Spirit in the Bottle. And then in Jung's Red Book, um, he uh, includes a fairy tale. To my knowledge, it's an original fairy tale. I don't think he copied it from anywhere or borrowed it. Uh, I've asked some uh, uh, local scholars of fairy tales if they know uh, of uh, sources for this fairy tale that Jung includes in the Red Book, but uh, it seems to be uh, generally considered to be an original. So I wanna take a look at that and uh, perhaps we can offer an interpretation, our interpretation of Jung's fairy tale. Although he does uh, do some interpreting of it himself in the Red Book. Um, I also want to say that uh, I very much appreciate the questions that uh, some of you uh, participants sent in after the first fairy tale seminar. Um, I have read them and I'm uh, going to try to weave uh, answers to your questions into uh, my presentations today and uh, on November 1st. Um, and uh, I find that they're uh, uh, very provocative and, and uh, interesting questions uh, that really bring out uh, a couple of important points. Uh, one of you asked about uh, the uh, clinical reasoning uh, that uh, Jungians would use for the use of fairy tales in analysis uh, to amplify perhaps dreams or experiences. Um, and I think we will uh, see some instances where um, that has been done. I can, I can make some references to the literature on that and also perhaps give some examples um, and other questions of a similar sort. So please continue sending questions and I will certainly take cognizance of them and try to weave them into my presentations um, as we go. So um, the um, interpretation that Jung offers of the fairy tale, the spirit in the bottle, uh, comes from a, um, a lecture that he gave at Aronos, uh, at the Aronos conference in August of 1942. Uh, his work is published in volume 13 of the collected works, um, beginning uh, with paragraph 239. So those of you who are interested to uh, read his text, we'll find it there. Or if you're really uh, 
serious scholars, you can also go to the Aranos Yarbuch of 1942 and read his first version, um, which is uh, somewhat different, uh, slightly abbreviated. Uh, he extended his interpretation when he published it in a, in a book uh, in 1948 called uh, Symbolic Disguise to Symbolism of the Spirit um, and added a few passages, but basically um, it's the same text as he presented at the Aranos uh, lectures in uh, 1942. Uh, this is a picture of the um, inside of that book. You see the picture of Hermes on the left and uh, the Aranos Yarbuch 1942. The subject for that year was uh, Das Hermetische Prinzip in Mythologie, Gnosis und Alchemy, the Hermetic Principle in Mythology, uh, Gnosticism and Alchemy. Um, and a lovely picture of Hermes uh, and uh, uh, a friend of his uh, on the left uh, page of that. Uh, picture. Um, in addition to Jung that year, we uh, see that there were uh, four other lecturers. Um, it was a very small conference because this is 1942 in the middle of the war. Uh, Switzerland was isolated. There was no travel possible in or into or out, or at least it was very difficult to get in or out of Switzerland. And so the speakers all came from local areas. Karl Karinje uh, is originally from Budapest, but he lived in Switzerland during the war. And he um, presented at this lecture, uh, Hermes Guide of Souls, Hermes Erzelenfer, this Mythologum von Mainlichen Lebensursprung. Uh, this became uh, Karl Karinje's book, Hermes Guide of Souls. So very important uh, lecture uh, on part of Karl Karinje on the subject of Hermes. And uh, then we see that uh, Professor Jung uh, from Zurich gave a lecture called Der Geist Mercurius, the spirit Mercu uh, Mercurius. Um, and so he's deep in his studies of alchemy at this time in 1942. And he picks this text from the Brothers Grimm uh, to take off on a discussion of the spirit Mercurius in alchemy. Um, here you uh, see a picture of Jung at Aranos. I don't know the exact date of this. It's probably a little later than 1942. Jung looks a bit older in this picture, but um, there he is in his uh, costume, his outfit as he would dress when he went down into the southern part of Switzerland to the test scene in August. It would be quite warm and he enjoyed himself a great deal at Aranos. Uh, here you see Jung at middle age in his garden with a couple of dogs. Um, that's probably about how he looked at the time that he gave this particular lecture at Aranosa. I show you these pictures just to give you an impression of Jung the man. This is a portrait of Jung uh, drawn um, by a uh, Russian Jewish artist who lived in Switzerland at the time. Um, 1935, this is for Jung's 60th birthday. But there you have C.G. Jung. Now, I'm going to read the text uh, that Jung includes in his essay. It's short. He doesn't give the whole of the Grimm's version of the text. He, he reduces it um, and uh, condenses it a bit, but all of the essential material from the fairy tale uh, is here. And um, he says about it um, that the spirit of the bottle, uh, the spirit in the bottle, a Grimm's fairy tale, is ever living like all fairy tales, and moreover contains the quintessence and deepest meaning of the hermetic mystery as it has come down to us today. So he puts uh, quite a lot of um, weight uh, on the importance of this fairy tale uh, by saying that it contains the quintessence and deepest meaning of the hermetic mystery, which is quite a statement. Um, 
normally we think of fairy tales as rather lightweight and uh, uh, children's matter. Uh, however, uh, Jung and Jungians and Mary Louise von Franz, to be sure, and Erich Neumann, as we'll see in our next seminar, um, found profound wisdom in fairy tales, uh, uh, very um, uh, 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 descriptions of deep uh, psychic processes and structures uh, that show us the uh, lineaments of the collective unconscious in the archetypal world. So uh, it's no small matter for a, a Jungian to take up interpretation of a fairy tale because the belief is, a thought the hypothesis is, that we are looking into the very bottom uh, portions of the human psyche and into the collective unconscious. So this is the fairy tale that Jung is going to interpret. It goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a poor woodcutter. He had an only son whom he wished to send to a high school. However, since he could give him only a little money to take with him, it was used up long before the time for the examination. So the son went home and helped his father with the work in the forest. Once during the midday rest, he roamed the woods and came to an immense old oak. There he heard a voice calling from the ground. Let me out, let me out. He dug down among the roots of the tree and found a well-sealed glass bottle from which clearly the voice had come. He opened it and instantly a spirit rushed out and soon became half as high as the tree. The spirit cried in an awful voice, I have had my punishment and I will be revenged. I am the great and mighty spirit Mercurius, and now you shall have your reward. Whoso releases me, him I must strangle. This made the boy uneasy, I imagine to say the least, and quickly thinking up a trick, he said, First, I must be sure that you are the same spirit that was shut up in that little bottle. To prove this, the spirit crept back into the bottle. Then the boy made haste to seal it, and the spirit was caught again. But now the spirit promised to reward him rich, richly if the boy would let him out. So he let him out and received a reward as a reward, a small piece of rag. Quoth the spirit, if you spread one end of this over a wound, it will heal. And if you rub steel or iron with the other end, it will turn into silver. Thereupon the boy rubbed his damaged axe with a rag and the axe turned to silver, and he was able to sell it for 400 taller. Thus father and son were freed from all worries. The young man could return to his studies, and later, thanks to his rag, he became a famous doctor. So that is the account. Here I show you a picture of Mercurius in the tree, uh, the tree of alchemy, as it's called with all the various operations. And Mercurius is uh, probably the central figure of alchemy. He's the spirit in the bottle. He's what makes the process work. It, it is said about him that he is there at the beginning and at the end and in the middle of the process. And so it's all about Mercurius. And so what this young man has discovered in the bottle is uh, a very powerful force of nature uh, that can uh, bring about uh, transformations of health and uh, uh, transform base metals into noble metals. Uh, for instance, uh, a iron axe into silver. 
uh, in the Grimm's fairy tale, when the young man turns his axe into silver, he goes to cut a, a tree down and the axe bends. So the axe as silver is too soft to function as an axe. So then he goes and sells the axe and brings home the $400 and he and his father can pay off all their debts and he can go to school and the rest of the story is very positive. Um, now, Jung is going to offer an interpretation of this um, fairy tale. And I'm going to um, just bring back for a moment the von Franz method, and then we will see how Jung uses this method in making his interpretation, or if he does. And uh, now von Franz wrote her book long after Jung wrote his interpretation of this fairy tale. So partially, she's probably drawing from what she knew about Jung's methods of interpreting uh, material like fairy tales, myths, dreams, and so on. But I think uh, as we went over her method last time, you could see that it's quite useful for uh, bringing some order into one's considerations of the meaning of a fairy tale. So uh, just to remind you, here's von Franz. She says, how do we approach the meaning of a fairy tale or stalk it rather, because it's rather like stalking a very evasive stag. Um, that's her general approach that you know, one has to be careful and very clever. Um, and keep an open mind and imagine oneself into the life of the fairy tale as a hunter imagines himself into the mind of a stag in order to stalk it. Um, and then she gives her method. She says, just as for the dream, we divide the archetypal story into four stages of the classical drama. We consider time and place. We consider the dramatis personae. And she says, I recommend counting the number of people at the beginning and the end. Uh, in our story, there isn't very much difference between the number of people at the beginning and end of this story. And then the third thing is naming the problem. What uh, is the problem that the uh, fairy tale is addressing? There's got to be a, a difficulty or there would be no story. Uh, so that would be uh, the third matter, stating what is the problem in terms of fairy tale. And then the fourth, fourth step, the peripatia, the ups and downs of the story, uh, you generally get a climax, a decisive point, where is the whole thing going? Does it go into a tragedy or does it come out right? And then there's a lysis or sometimes a catastrophe. Um, she also makes note of amplification as a method, and that is to we have to look at the comparative material before we can say anything definite. We have to ask whether that motif occurs in other tales and how it is in, in other tales, take an average. Amplification means enlarging through collecting a quantity of parallels. When you have a collection of parallels, then you pass on to the next motif. So this is a, a part a, or a step in the interpretation of fairy tales, and we'll see how Jung does that. And then finally, two more, a context, constructing a context. Um, and we will consider that in uh, the case of these fairy tales, there is a collective context in both of them. That's very important to consider. And also a personal context, certainly in the Red Book fairy tale. Uh, what was the author of the uh, Red Book going through at the time that this fairy tale appears in his text? Um, we'll consider those contexts. Uh, and we'll see, does Jung consider a context? Uh, he certainly does very strongly in interpreting the fairy tale of, of the spirit in the bottle. And then comes the last essential step, which is the interpretation itself. This is a translation of the amplified story into psychological language. The terrible mother who is overcome by the hero becomes the inertia of unconsciousness is overcome by an impulse toward a higher level of consciousness. So turning the, uh, the uh, narrative into psychological language is the final step, and that's what gives us the interpretation. Okay, let's see what Jung does with the story. Uh, von Franz also has this interesting statement uh, that she says, um, after working for many years, I have come to the conclusion that all fairy tales endeavor to describe one and the same psychic fact but a fact so complex and far-reaching and so difficult for us to realize in all its different aspects. 
that hundreds of tales and thousands of repetitions with a mu musician's variations are needed until this unknown face or fact is delivered into consciousness. This unknown fact is what Jung calls the self. And we'll see how we can use that notion in the interpretation of Jung's fairy tale and how Jung uses the idea of the self, uh, that the fairy tale really is about the self, uh, showing us something of the self uh, in his interpretation. So let's see what Jung does with this fairy tale. First of all, he gives a synopsis of the fairy tale. I would say it's a very accurate synopsis. He leaves out a few details that the, that the brothers Grimm have in their story, but uh, nothing terribly important. And so then he takes um, uh, the story piece by piece, and he um, amplifies, translates, um, uh, works it into a uh, and toward a psychological understanding. So, first of all, he uh, has a section called Explanation of Forest and Tree. This is the setting. He's considering the setting, as von Franz says, at the first stage is to consider the setting. Where does the story take place? And, of course, it takes place in the forest. And uh, Jung um, writes that the forest um, is like, um, like the ocean, um, a symbol for the unconscious. Um, that uh, the scene in which the story is taking place is in the forest. Uh, so what is being discovered is in the unconscious. And we're going to consider um, the uh, the drama, the peripatia, and, and the lysis and everything in those terms, that this is showing us something about what's in the unconscious and uh, how uh, uh, that may uh, be influencing the world of consciousness as well. He says that the fairy tale is a self-portrait of the unconscious, that fairy tales are spontaneous statements of the unconscious about itself, he says. So that's a, a point of view about fairy tales, that fairy tales are the unconscious, they're spontaneous, the unconscious is telling us something about itself, but like dreams, we have to interpret them if we want to understand what it's saying. Uh, Jung would often say the dream is its own explanation, only it's speaking in another language, and we have to translate that language into our language, into the language of our conscious world and our own um, uh, understandings of ourself and, and the world around us. Trees, um, forest is full of trees, of course. Trees, he says, represent the living contents of the unconscious. And they're like fish in the water. If you have a dream about, uh, as we did when we saw last time in the story of the, the white snake, the fish in the water, uh, they're the contents of the unconscious. So trees are living contents of the unconscious. Um, the unconscious is full of trees, the forest is full of trees, so there's a lot of contents in there. But one is selected and particularly focused on, and that is the oak. And so Jung amplifies the oak, uh, and he says it's um, in German um, culture and, and history, mythology, that the oak is considered the king of the forest. He's like the lion, the king of the animals. And this king of the forest, uh, the oak tree, uh, Jung says, represents uh, the self. It is the prototype of the self, a symbol of the source and goal of the individuation process. So the oak tree um, is uh, the, um, where the bottle is going to be found. It's found in the roots of the oak tree. So what this young man has done is penetrate into the unconscious and come upon uh, the self and has unearthed something there. Now the hero, the young man, Jung says about him that he's unconscious of the self. He's just stumbling around in the unconscious. He doesn't really know what he's doing. He doesn't even recognize what he finds. Uh, he doesn't know what the oak tree uh, symbolizes, represents, or what might be in the bottle. He just, uh, he's, uh, Jung, he says he's one of the sleepers. He's somebody who isn't awake yet. He hasn't been enlightened yet. So he's like all of us who stumble around in our own unconscious, uh, half asleep, and have to be awakened to 
um, what's going on uh, in the depths. Um, and uh, the roots of the tree, um, Jung amplifies and, and uh, interprets as the body. Uh, it's what goes down into the cellular, cellular level, uh, the self at its most basic, uh, even atomic level, the cellular level of the self located in the body. And uh, he'll have some things to say about this later. Why is the spirit there? Why was it buried there uh, in the body, not in the uh, crown of the tree, up in the higher levels, but down in the cellular level of the body? That's where the spirit, uh, Mercurius, is buried. Then uh, the next section he calls the spirit in the bottle. And um, here uh, he talks about, uh, we could say, the dramatis personae. He's already taken them up in a way. He talked about the hero as one of the sleepers. And now he's going to talk about the spirit in the mouth. Now, the spirit is probably the most important figure in, this, in the story. Uh, the fairy tale is really all about the spirit. Um, and it's a mystery. It's a mystery why the spirit is there, what, who the spirit is, what the spirit uh, can do and not do, and so on. And so, Jung is very interested in amplifying and understanding who the spirit is. Now he names himself as Mercurius, and we'll see what Jung does with that. Um, first of all, Jung says the spirit, this spirit in the bottle, uh, represents the principle of individuation. It is uh, the spirit of the unconscious that wants to individuate. So it's a drive and it's a force, but it's been confined in a bottle in the roots of the self. So it's restricted, it's confined, but it's the principle of individuation. Now we know for Jung, this is an extremely important drive in the human psyche. And so, uh, what is being unearthed and, and released is the spirit, is the principle of individuation when the spirit comes out of the bottle. And then he says a little more about the tree, that it's the visible level of individuation and self-realization. Uh, the tree, which uh, Jung writes about extensively in a later essay published a few years later called The Philosophical Tree, also in volume 13 of the Collected Works, um, uh, the tree, for, in Jung's understanding, as a symbol, represents the individuation process. That is, a psyche unfolding over time from a, a, a very early form as a seed or a bulb, uh, an acorn, the acorn theory uh, that uh, James Hillman, for instance, used in one of his books to talk about human destiny. That um, Michael Fordham says, when we're born, we bring a self into the world with us. We are a self. We um, this uh, is the potential that will grow over time through the individuation process into a full-blown or a neurotic or restricted or damaged or whatever uh, a human being that uh, is represented by a tree. Now, there are, there's a famous psychological tree test. You ask a child or someone to draw a tree and in that picture, if you interpret it uh, as their individuation process, you can see points of damage, restriction, restraint, trauma, so on and so forth. So the tree symbolizes the growth of the psyche through time, and it has deep roots, and those roots go down into the cellular level, level cellular level. Uh, a few years after this, in uh, 1950, I think it was, Jung published a book called Ion, which has a whole chapter on theory of the self. And there he shows all the different uh, various levels from the highest to the lowest down through the cellular, the body, uh, this atomic, even subatomic level down into energy, um, using uh, uh, some of his understandings of modern physics and so on. So the notion of the self as an all-inclusive um, entity uh, 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 includes uh, the cellular bodily level as well as our higher conscious 
spiritual and so on uh, aspects of the self. Now, um, so that's the tree. It's the visible level of self-realization. What you see, what you don't see is down below the ground. So the bottle then, uh, he interprets and amplifies um, and, and translates into a psychological uh, language, into a psychological concept. He says a bottle is a conscious intellectual construction. In other words, the bottle is man-made. Somebody made the bottle and put the spirit in it. It is not a product of nature. So uh, it's a human construct. Uh, it's a product of consciousness. And Jung says that what, what contains the spirit and sometimes restricts it or an alchemy, very important, the vessel to contain Mercurius, to cook him and uh, to cook the, the uh, materials, the prima materia that's put into the vessel. Um, Jung uh, interprets this uh, psychologically as ideas and doctrines. Um, and these contain and restrict the spirit uh, also the spirit of evil, the spirit of destruction, which we will see is contained in this bottle in the forest. He's a very angry spirit. Uh, at first, he's not at all benign. And so um, Jung uh, sees that it's a, quite a dangerous thing just to pull a uh, cork uh, off the bottle and let him out. Uh, so somebody has built and constructed a bottle in the course of history, you will say, over time, a bottle was constructed to contain the spirit, and it was hidden by somebody uh, in the roots of the tree. Um, he'll want to say quite a bit about that. Uh, who who was the um, who was responsible for for making the bottle and putting the spirit in the bottle, hiding it at the base of the tree? And then you know, looks at Mercurius. Now it's. Uh, very unusual that um, figures in fairy tales have names. Um, usually they're um, simply referred to as the king, the queen, uh, the hero, the servant, so on. They don't have specific names. We don't talk about, well, there is Iron John. I mean, there are, there are a few exceptions, but not very many. And in the Grimm's fairy tales, it's uh, quite unusual that a figure would have a name. And he gives himself the name. Mercurius. He says, I am the spirit Mercurius. Now, who is Mercurius? Well, Jung, very interestingly, I think, um, uh, relates a Mercurius uh, to the spirit Wotan. This is a German fairy tale. And um, when uh, Christianity came into, into Europe and uh, the Germanic tribes were were baptized forcibly, usually, uh, rather than by conviction or conversion or, um, you know, uh, actual uh, belief in the new religion that was offered them. Uh, they were more or less forced to become Christians um, when uh, out of political necessity. Um, and uh, at the uh, at the end of a sword, so to speak, and so there was a repression of the indigenous religions, and this happened over and over again in the history of Christianity, when the missionaries went in behind the armies, um, South America, for instance, Spanish and the Portuguese, the missionaries come in right behind the soldiers and begin baptizing the indigenous population and demonizing their religion, saying it's of the devil, and that's what happened in Germany too. And, the Germanic tribes in Europe, that uh, Wotan, who was the chief god, the Zeus, so to speak, of the Germanic uh, peoples, and whose sacred tree was the oak tree, um, uh, he was uh, demonized, identified with the devil, and so on, and banished from consciousness, in other words, repressed, culturally speaking, and Christianity built its churches uh, often over the uh, sacred sites of the pagan uh, temples and, and uh, sacred spots, uh, stones, trees, and so on. Um, and so this uh, uh, spirit of, uh, of uh, the, the Votanic religion was 
put into a, a container, a man-made container, a doctrine about evil, um, a belief system uh, created by the Christian theologians, and buried uh, in the body. Uh, in other words, repressed down into the lower levels of the unconscious and disappeared from conscious life and from cultural life. And so there it is uh, in, at the base of the tree, in the roots of the tree, and our young man uh, stumbles upon this. Um, and Jung speculates a bit about who, uh, who is the master who put that spirit in the bottle. And as I said, it's, it's basically the Christian religion, the New Testament uh, religion. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, ruler of that religion is the one that uh, Christians worship as God. So Jung says, God put Mercurius in the bottle and buried him at the bottom of the, in the roots of the tree. Um, that is the Christian God is responsible for this. And it was hermetically sealed. Now, um, because it was dangerous. Um, Hume also mentions a, uh, a, a very common fairy tale motif. It's called, uh, he calls it the spellbound spirit. Um, for instance, in the Thousand and One Nights, you have quite a few uh, instances of this where a genie is let out of the bottle, out of a bottle buried in the sea or found somewhere, and uh, can offer all kinds of extraordinary things. Uh, sometimes they're dangerous, sometimes they're very beneficent and helpful, uh, but always they're very powerful. And uh, it's, a, it's a widespread motif, the spellbound spirit. Now this question that somebody asked last time um, about uh, relevance uh, of fairy tales to clinical work, um, one could think about this, uh, these motifs that crop up in fairy tales over and over again, such as the spellbound spirit, um, uh, could appear in a person's, um, uh, in, a, in a patient's uh, dreams or fantasies uh, or life experiences, that there has been a repression of something very important, namely the principle of individuation, uh, that cultural conditioning has been very, very strong, and that uh, the, the uh, natural flow of life and life process and unfolding has been really corked and put under for the sake of developing a very strong persona, a heavily made up face, a mask, and the person is expected to live within uh, those structures. And so this uh, notion of the, re the spellbound spirit uh, being put away in the body, perhaps even developing somatic symptoms or uh, uh, neurotic symptoms um, through uh, various indirect channels um, uh, is a clinical uh, uh, phenomenon that uh, was discovered by Freud and uh, uh, psychoanalysis really was founded upon the idea of uh, rep a repressed spirit uh, lying dormant in the unconscious and causing all kinds of problems. Uh, Freud focused on repressed sexuality, um, especially with the young women that he was working with the hysterics in Vienna at the, at the turn of the century. Um, but um, it can be much broader than that, or it can be different than that. The repressed spirit could be something else, not necessarily only uh, the sexual drive, but a repressed individuation process itself, stopped up spellbound spirit. And when it's released, can cause all kinds of mischief and chaos and uh, even destruction because he's very angry when he comes out. So you see, the, um, the, the knowledge of fairy tales can help to orient oneself to uh, what's going on in a clinical case uh, along lines such as this. I mentioned that in response to one of the questions that came in last time, a very good one, I thought. Um, 
Then Jung talks about the relationship of the spirit to the tree, of spirit to the tree. Um, and uh, now he begins to uh, amplify the tree some more, the oak tree, which he, he said was a symbol of self, he associates to the tree of paradise and the spirit uh, to the snake in paradise. So um, uh, the, the, the snake in the tree or the spirit in the tree um, is um, an age old motif um, that uh, one can find in various mythologies and uh, folk tales and so on. And in this section, and I'm not going to spend much time on it, but it's very interesting. Jung talks about five stages of consciousness uh, from the first stage, which says that the, uh, that the tree is a spirit. Uh, the second stage that says a spirit lives in the tree. The third stage makes a moral distinction, says the spirit is good or it's bad. The fourth stage says there is no spirit in the tree. There's just a tree there. And that's the modern enlightened spirit where we have the what's the Cartesian split where we say the, the material world uh, has no psyche, no soul. Psyche and soul is all in us. Uh, if we think the object has psyche or soul in it, we're projecting our own psyche or soul into it. Uh, it is without soul itself. Um, that is uh, the fourth stage of consciousness, and that has allowed science to progress to treat objects as neutral, not to have any fantasies about the objects, to conduct scientific experiments uh, in a neutral, unbiased, uh, supposedly uh, clean, uh, clean-minded way, uh, devoid of illusions and uh, psychic material, simply relying on uh, mathematics and instruments and so on for testing and measuring and uh, creating experiments in the laboratory. Uh, that's the fourth stage of consciousness. And then the fifth stage of consciousness is uh, the recognition that the psyche is alive and real and is uh, a very dynamic agent in the world, and not only in the human world, but in the anima mundi, in the world around us. So it's kind of coming back to the earlier stages, but in a different way, in a more conscious way, and without abandoning the fourth stage of recognizing uh, the world is objective and we're a part of the world and, and so on. But uh, uh, realizing that the psyche is also real and that even hallucinations have a meaning and dreams have a meaning and uh, that we need to um, uh, pay attention to that. So um, that's his reflection on uh, the relationship of the spirit to the tree. And then he goes into the problem of releasing Mercurius. And this is a very interesting section. Uh, it seems in the fairy tale that everything comes out just fine. Uh, the, the hero um, gets this rag and with the rag, he can do wonderful things. He can heal and he can create great wealth. And so he becomes a famous doctor. Um, Jung wonders about that and he says, well, he's probably just one of the lucky ones. This happened to him. Uh, he's a lucky soul because sometimes uh, you aren't so lucky and uh, aren't clever and quick enough to put them, uh, uh, to trick the um, spirit back into the bottle. And once he's loose, he can strangle you. And so the danger of releasing the spirit uh, is, is quite awesome. And Jung reflects on it now, not so much from a personal angle, but from a cultural angle. And he's thinking about alchemy and the release of Mercurius uh, in uh, the history of alchemy. Uh, in the history of alchemy, uh, Mercurius generally was kept in the flask and worked with, and um, he was the process and the instigator of transformation in the vessel. And once it was finished, then you could take the gold or whatever it was out of the vessel and uh, use it for uh, purposes like healing, becoming rich or whatever, uh, transforming objects, transforming yourself. Um, to, uh, Jung says it's it was a mistake on the part of this uh, young hero simply to let it loose in the world. Now where is it? Where has it gone? Yes, he got a rag. 
Yes, he's one of the lucky ones, but uh, what has he released into the world? And this associating the spirit to uh, uh, Votan, uh, Jung recognizes as the release of a very dangerous spirit, that Votanic spirit that we're thinking now, 1942, okay, uh, what's going on in Europe at this time, uh, in the middle of the war, and um, and Germany is winning the war in 1942. It has conquered uh, most of Europe, and it's uh, on the road to victory in Russia. Uh, in August 1942 was probably the height of German conquest of the world, uh, and it was on a uh, you would have been very bold to bet against uh, the Germany winning the war at this moment. So Jung says that somewhere around the end of the 16th to the middle of the 17th century, this was the height of alchemy. And at that moment, uh, a split occurred. Uh, the scientific revolution took hold and enlightenment and um, alchemy became a spiritual endeavor and chemistry uh, took over uh, the scientific side, the material side. Uh, but um, uh, in this, uh, also in this period, the, the revolutions that would um, uh, overtake Europe and upset Europe uh, and revolution and uh, turn Europe upside down for centuries were uh, unleashed. The spirit of individuation was unleashed, he said. In other words, as the hold of the Christian church lost its power, Protestant Revolution and the Protestant Reformation became stronger. Uh, the spirit of individual, uh, individualism and uh, the freedom, uh, individual freedom became stronger and stronger. And uh, the individuation process, the spirit of individuation was no longer contained by any doctrines. So it's the danger is uh, that um, uh, the spirit can be very devilish uh, and destructive. And uh, for a time, he was tricked into his better nature, but not permanently. So Jung wonders, well, where is he now? And what's going on? And was this a good thing? Or should the spirit of Mercurius been kept in the bottle longer? Uh, maybe the master who hid him under the tree should have come back and worked with him some more. A summary of Jung's interpretation is then that the psychological meaning of the fairy tale, which is uh, the principle of individuation, was confined by religious doctrines and was meant to be processed inwardly, but it was released and is now free to move about in the world. Is this good or dangerous? Is freedom to individuate a good thing? Is this spirit dangerous? And he insists that the outcome is ambiguous. It might be good to release the spirit of freedom and individuation for everyone in the world and for all cultures to follow their own um, designs. But he also says without some containment and some process, this is a very dangerous spirit and it can be a very immoral, immoral, amoral spirit. It simply insists on uh, realizing any potentials that are available in the core of the self. And the self is a union of opposites, according to Jung's theory. Now, looking at contemporary events is quite interesting, just to um, expand our uh, context a little bit. Um, as I said, the uh, Ernest conference at which you have presented this uh, took place in early August of 1942. And uh, in the introduction to the Ernos Jahrbuch, uh, which is the publication of those papers, uh, Olga Frebe Kapitan uh, wrote about the spirit of the times, how dark it was, how discouraging, how desperate uh, that uh, 
people could, it, it was so bad people couldn't even think about uh, uh, how possible outcomes and uh, what was going to happen to Europe and to the world. Um, and in that climate, she held the Eranos conference, she says, to dwell on eternal truths, on fundamental things that uh, she wanted to uh, have an, uh, an oasis, a cultural oasis, so to speak, where um, for a moment at least people, uh, scholars, a few who could gather there, could consider um, the ancient verities of philosophy and mythology and uh, bracket for the moment what was going on around them. Um, and so I'm sure it was um, a, a very fine meeting that they had there, uh, kind of reprieve for the moment from what was going on in the newspapers and, and the uh, radio broadcasts and so on. Now, in late August, August 23rd, 1942, the Battle of Stalingrad began. And this was um, Hitler's push to um, decapitate Russia by taking over the city named after its leader, Stalingrad, and also to cut off a, a supply route uh, from uh, the uh, sources of energy and food uh, to Moscow. And so the Battle of Stalingrad raged from the 23rd of August to the 2nd of February, 1943. It was a major, perhaps the major battle of World War II. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, it was very close uh, that uh, Germany lost uh, that battle. And in losing that battle, um, they, uh, Hitler refused to let them retreat from Stalingrad. And finally, a large portion of the German army was surrounded by Russian forces. The city was destroyed and that part of the army was destroyed. And as a result of that, it really was considered the turning point of the war. Germany was weakened. They had to take troops out of Western Europe, send them to the East. And that made possible the invasion of Europe, the successful invasion of Europe uh, in 1944, when Eisenhower uh, managed the uh, beaches of Omaha and so on. Uh, so this, it's, it's interesting that this reflection on the spirit Mercurius is ambiguity and the dangers of the release of photon in the world uh, comes at this critical moment in world history, really. Um, and I'm sure Jung was very, very aware, as who could not be in Switzerland, uh, they had news from all sides here, uh, of the precarious uh, uh, situation that they all found themselves in at this moment. Um, now, the implication of Jung's interpretation, if we uh, interpret the interpretation for a moment, um, and this, this also has clinical relevance, and I think uh, all clinicians are aware of the danger of releasing uh, such powerful forces in a, in a client's psyche without proper containment in the analytic vessel. Um, the release of the individuation drive in modernity, this, is, this would be um, uh, a reflection on Jung's uh, interpretation, the release of the individuation drive in modernity is of ambiguous value. It can result in health and wealth, that is full individuation, as we saw with the hero in the story for some, but also leads to pathological selfishness or shadow possession in others. And that's what one saw on a collective level in Nazi Germany when Wotan simply took over and was the shadow of the Christian uh, God and uh, it was a God of storm and war and, and raging and anger and, and revenge um, on, a, on a cultural level, uh, on a personal level, you sometimes see this kind of development as well. Perhaps a cultural container and analysis would be what Jungians would have to offer 
um, but there might be other possibilities. A cultural container is needed to cook the spirit of individuation further. That is to work on an inner level rather than falling into anything goes, relativism and individualism. And of course, this has been uh, a critique launched uh, modern culture uh, uh, by many people, sociologists and psychologists, that the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of individualism. There is a diminished sense of community in Western countries uh, and cultures and um, uh, relativism is um, uh, a, a very common uh, belief. Nothing really matters. Nothing is really much better than anything else. And so the containment uh, offered by reflection, by doctrines, by beliefs has been more or less exploded and put away. And so we have a, uh, a kind of rampant individualism uh, in most of our Western cultures today. And if you try to thwart that in any way, uh, you usually <laughs> experience the wrath of Wotan. <clears throat> because he doesn't want to go back in his bottle. Uh, now, I want to turn for the rest of our time to look at uh, the fairy tale that Jung includes in the Red Book. Um, I think it's the only fairy tale in the Red Book. I mean, there are many stories and episodes and incidents, but this is an explicit fairy tale that occurs uh, in uh, Liber Secundus, that is the uh, second book uh, of the Red Book, in, a, in the last chapter of Liber Secundus, in a chapter called The Magician. And um, I think this, uh, this fairy tale that is um, actually delivered to Jung by the serpent um, has some interesting parallels to the one that we've just discussed that Jung interprets in 1942. Um, this fairy tale occurs uh, or is told to Jung by the serpent on the 23rd of February, 1914. So quite a few years earlier when Jung is in his, right in the, in the midst of his uh, most uh, uh, intense, uh, experience of active imagination. Uh, he hasn't yet started composing the Red Book. He's simply having the experiences that will later be written up and go into the Red Book and the paintings created and so on later. Um, and this is a fairy tale that begins, once upon a time there was a king and he had no children. But he would, he would have liked to have a son so he went to a wise woman who lived as a witch in the forest and confessed all his sins as if she were a priest appointed by God. To this she said, Dear king, you have done what you should not have done. And since it has come to pass, it has come to pass, and we will have to see how you can do better in the future. Take a pound of otter lard, bury it in the earth, and let nine months pass. Then dig up, dig up that place again and see what you find. So the king went to his house, ashamed and saddened because he had humiliated himself before the witch in the forest. Yet he listened to her advice, dug a hole in the garden at night and placed a pot of otter lard in it, which he had obtained with some difficulty. Then he let nine months go by. After this time passed, he went again by night to the place where the pot lay buried and dug it up. To his great astonishment, he found a sleeping infant in the pot, though the lard had disappeared. He took out the infant and jubilantly brought it to his wife. She took it immediately to her breast and behold, her milk flowed freely. And so the child thrived and became great and strong. He grew into a man who was greater and stronger than all the others. And when the king's son was 20 years older, he came before his father and said, 
I know that you have produced me through sorcery and that I was not born as one of men. You have made me from the repentance of your sins, and this has made me strong. I am born from no woman, which makes me clever. I am strong and clever, and therefore I demand the crown of the realm from you. The old king was startled at his son's knowledge, but even more by his impetuous longing for regal power. He remained silent and thought, what has produced you? Otter lord, who bore you, the womb of the earth? I drew you from a pot, a witch humiliated me, and he decided to let his son be killed secretly. So here we have a story that begins with a king who doesn't have a son. Uh, he's living uh, in his kingdom. The wife is hardly mentioned. We don't know why he doesn't have a child, but he would like to have a son to take over the kingdom, I guess, to succeed him. And so he goes into the woods. Now we know the Young's interpretation of the woods, a wise old woman, a witch living in the forest, that's a spirit in the unconscious, spirit of the feminine, and she gives him instructions of what to do. Take otter lard and put it in a pot and bury it for nine months. Why otter lard? Well, if you uh, have the time, Google uh, otter, otter symbol, and you'll come up with all kinds of uh, wonderful stories about otters. Otters uh, um, are very playful, they're very uh, uh, maternal, they're, they're related to the water, and they're really, uh, uh, you could say, a, a symbol of a very fruitful and, and uh, fertile and playful uh, unconscious that has uh, the potential to produce something very good. Um, uh, there is a, a, another side to otters. There, there's a dark side, so it's an ambiguous symbol, as all symbols are. Uh, but uh, I showed you a picture back here, and this is from a, a lovely book about uh, um, animal symbolism, uh, a book that was published by Chiron a few years ago, entitled Animal Life in Nature, Myth and Dreams by Elizabeth Gaspari. And uh, she has a couple of pages on otters and otter symbolism in there. And uh, she um, concludes by saying, um, the otter's strong and loving maternal instinct, the deep, positive, loving, and caring connection that this animal manifests is, mon is among the most powerful forces. Uh, so this is the maternal womb of the unconscious, you could say, that uh, Jung has gone to, or the king, king has gone to. Um, and um, there uh, he has incubated a child in the unconscious, and the child is then brought forth, uh, brought out of the womb, and raised. And it's an extraordinary child. It's a magical child. This is no ordinary child. He's stronger than others. He's smarter than others. He's a, a gifted divine child. And he, in a sense, has no mother. As Athena says uh, about herself, I have no mother. She is born strictly from the father. So there's a father, son, but born out of the unconscious, out of a maternal womb in the unconscious. But the king uh, isn't ready to give up his power. He wants an heir and a successor, but uh, he doesn't want to give up his power yet. And so, he becomes murderous. Uh, he actually arranges to have his son killed. He goes to the old witch in the, in the forest again, and she tells him how to do it. She says, dear king, um, I advise you to bury another pot with otter's lard and leave it to lie on the earth for nine months, then dig it up again. The king does it. And in the meantime, his son gets sick and weak and dies and uh, and in the end, he lays uh, dead in the uh, dead beside the empty pot. Uh, now the king becomes depressed, and uh, he uh, uh, misses his son, and he has no future, and he realizes he's made a mistake. So, uh, and this is where it resembles a bit the other the other fairy tale. He has to do something a second time. Uh, in the other one, the uh, hero had to trick the spirit Mercurius back into the bottle. 
and then bring him out a second time. Here, um, he's going to have to incubate the child again a second time and bring it out. And the witch, he goes to the witch and she tells him to do just that. And when nine months passed, he dug the pot out again and there's the magical baby again, uh, a sleeping infant. And he realizes that the infant was his dead son and now he brings him home and the infant grows up very quickly, much faster than before. It doesn't take 20 years. And this time when he comes and asks for the power and the throne, um, the king got up from his throne and embraced his son with tears of joy and crowned him king. And so the son who had thus become king was grateful to his father and held him in high esteem as long as his father was granted life. So the king submits to the uh, to the new new power, the new force, the future, and uh, gives over the uh, rulership of the kingdom to his son. Now, if we look at this story, we can see the dramatis personae or the king, an old woman in the wood, the otter lard. I've said something about that. A magical child, and a mother who doesn't play much of a role. Uh, at the beginning of the story, Van Franz says, count the number of people. We have the king and his wife. At the end, we have the king and his son. We don't know what happened to the wife. She's very incidental in this story. Um, but the new thing that has come about, uh, definitely a transformation and a new uh, emergence of uh, a magical uh, figure, uh, is, uh, is uh, very um, uh, dramatic. Uh, naming the problem, the problem was with the future. The king had no offspring, he had no future. Uh, the child represents the future and the new birth and renewal. And so he's an aging king. Uh, we could say it's an old habit that is growing uh, uh, threadbare and tired and wearing out and it needs some new energy. Um, the king, of course, uh, represents a dominant of culture, as we'll see when we come to the interpretation. So the naming of the problem, the problem is there is no future. We have to look into the unconscious to see if a new birth and a new future is possible. The story, the Peripatia, unfolds in two stages, separated by a crisis, a depression, state of depression. And then there's a lysis, which is a, they lived happily ever after. So the ending is very positive. Now the amplification, um, much can be said about kings and von Franz has written about them widely. Generally, unlike the first uh, fairy tale of the woodcutter, the uh, poor uh, uh, peasant, uh, uh, the king is um, a dominant figure of culture and he represents or a dominant attitude of uh, a cultural attitude. And um, in this case, it's one that is, has no uh, offspring, no future, and is in danger of um, dying out. And so the king recognizes the, the danger and tries to do something about it. The old woman in the wood is a wise old woman. She is the feminine figure in the story. She's really the mother figure. She's the womb. She tells him what to do. And the otter uh, is the nurturance, the lard of the otter is the nurturance of the unconscious that can bring about an incubation process and uh, produce a, a magical child like this, almost a god child. Uh, and then the sun, of course, who represents the new life and the new attitude. And we don't know what he's going to offer, but he is very strong and he's uh, and he seems to he seems to be a, a non-biological offspring. Uh, there's something uh, spiritual about him. And later, not in the fairy tale itself, but later in the Red Book, he does ascend and becomes something like a sun god. Um, now, the context uh, in which this story takes place is somewhat complex. There's the Red Book text. That's one context, uh, and that's very interesting and very dramatic. Jung is really um, working out a, a huge problem about uh, uh, having to do with himself and with his own individuation process uh, and with the problem of, of being alone and submitting to higher powers and 
and not being so arrogant and not being so uh, certain about his ideas. So he, this uh, need to submit uh, is very clear in his narrative in, in, the, in the Red Book. And we see the king submitting to the new attitude, uh, which is a transcendent attitude. Uh, and this is in Jung's personal life situation, what he really has to do. Uh, also in the personal situation, we see a timeline and this uh, fairy tale occurs at a very particular moment uh, in this timeline, the personal context, we can see that Jung, uh, what, where Jung is in his professional life and his relation to psychoanalysis and his um, uh, career um, and Freud, uh, he breaks off with Freud early in 1913 uh, their last letter in September of 1913, he uh, goes to Munich to the Congress, is re-elected president of the IPA, but realizes that he can't really work with Freud anymore and with the Freudians. In October, he has impending uh, catastrophe visions on the train trip from Schaffhausen, where he sees Europe flooded with uh, blood and uh, frozen over. October 27th, then he begins his resignations. He resigns as the editor of the yearbook uh, and, and breaks off further collaboration with Freud. Then in November uh, 12th, the, the red book entries begin, the black book entries for Liber Primus and Liber Secundus. And then uh, shortly after in February, February 23rd, we get the fairy tale. And the fairy tale comes at the climax of Liber Secundus. When he finishes Liber Secundus on April 19th, uh, uh, the same day that he begins entries for the third part called Scrutinies. Uh, on that day, he makes a decision, and the next day, he writes a letter and resigns as the president of the IPA. Now, this resignation is a very important step for Jung, and uh, uh, 10 days later, he resigns his position at the University of Zurich. These are... Uh, submissions to uh, something that is still unknown, a new spirit uh, in, the, in the book, he calls it Philemon sometimes, the spirit of the, of the depths. This has risen up from the unconscious and is taking over. And Jung would say this is the individuation process, symbol of the self, and his ego has to submit to it. So he leaves the persona world of presidencies and positions and really sets out on his own path, now guided by an inner presence, an inner figure, Philemon, or this new king, a self, a sense of self that will guide him on a new path. And, uh, and then in August of that year, World War I starts. So um, this is, uh, again, a context on the, on the, uh, so on the, uh, contemporary world level, World War I, uh, the global war starts on the 28th of July, 1914, not very long after uh, this fairy tale appears and lasts until 1918. And this is the period of time when Jung is really very busy with his Red Book and the Red Book would really become his guiding star, uh, his orienting uh, 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 doctrine, um, experience uh, for the rest of his life. And so you could see in this fairy tale, he's telling the story of the ego's submission to the self uh, and the relativization of the ego. He is the king. Um, Jung, by the way, was a Leo and very regal in his appearance and in his attitudes. And so that ego has to uh, finally give up and submit, although it doesn't want to, it gets enraged the first time, kills off the process, has to go back, gets very depressed, has to go back, do it all over again. And then he comes to the conclusion of his uh, individuation process as it's shown in the Red Book. Now, a psychological interpretation of this story uh, might run something like this. An aging ego or conscious attitude, personal or collective, this would be the king who has no uh, uh, offspring, 
looks for renewal. It's an aging ego. We think of aging egos uh, at midlife or shortly after, uh, having achieved a, a certain status uh, in the world and um, now having to follow, uh, begin to follow a, another course in their individuation. And this aging ego or conscious attitude looks for renewal because the ego realizes it, it, it can't sustain itself. The king realizes he isn't going to live forever that, and that his grounding um, in, um, is insecure. Uh, a king is not secure unless he has uh, an heir. If, if a king dies without an heir, it's the end of his line. And people realize that he has no heir, and he becomes a lame duck. Uh, so kings need heirs, and they need renewal. And so does the ego. The ego realizes at a certain point in life that it can't sustain itself simply on its own steam. It needs an heir, and it needs, we would say, from a psychological interpretation, it needs the self, it needs something uh, greater than itself to rely on, and that has much greater potential than the ego on its own has. So there is at first a welcoming attitude to the emergent self. Um, it seems like such a good thing. Uh, and one finds this in, of course, in family life as well, great rejoicing when a child is born, but then as the child emerges and grows and gets older, causes problems, the parents realize it's uh, more than they bargain for often, uh, and in some cases even worry about being overthrown. And of course, Freud would write about the Oedipus uh, drama. And I was thinking that maybe the story could be interpreted as something to do with uh, Jung's relationship with Freud. Freud always worried that Jung was trying to kill him or had a death wish towards him. Uh, that Freud was the old king, Jung was the new one, Jung was overcoming and replacing the old one, the old one didn't want to give up yet. Uh, but it doesn't really work out that way because Freud never did give up his, his throne and he had some successors, but nobody like Jung. Uh, Jung, I think he recognized in Jung a possible worthy successor um, because of Jung's genius and uh, vitality, uh, but that didn't work out. Um, but I don't think the, the fairy tale is really only about that, although it does have this Oedipal aspect to it. The father kills the son in order to get rid of the uh, competition. Um, and Freud certainly did repress, thoroughly repressed uh, Jung from psychoanalytic, uh, psychoanalytic references and circles. Um, but I don't think it's a story about Freud. Or if it is, it's a story about that ends with the death of the son. This story goes on. Um, the ego at first defends itself and represses the emergent self because it threatens. And when we think about the release of the spirit from the bottle and the Votanic energy, we can see that uh, there, is a, there is a threat and a danger that a process will take over. The ego doesn't know where it's going and uh, it doesn't trust uh, in that future, and so it represses the individuation impulses. But then a depression follows. Uh, the king is back to where he was before. He hasn't solved his problem. He still has no issue and offspring. He has no future. So he reconsiders. Okay, he goes back. After the crisis, a second attempt is made, and this time it's successful. And now the ego places itself under the rulership of the self. This uh, <clears throat> the second time around, the sun grows up very rapidly. It doesn't take him 20 years. And this, uh, so in a sense, he simply picks up from where he left off before. And um, he hasn't been really killed. He hasn't really died. He's been put to sleep for a while. Now he's back. And so the individuation process uh, kicks in again. And this time, the ego realizes that he has to uh, put himself under the direction of the self. The ego has to fall under the authority of the self 
And it turns out that the self is benevolent in this case, uh, in the case of this fairy tale. So I think Jung is telling himself or has told a story, relax, okay? It will be all right if you put yourself under the rulership of the self. You've got a good future with that one. And indeed he did. Uh, he had a wonderful future following the self and not continuing in his old path. Had he stayed with his uh, previous commitments with Freud and, and at the university, he would have lived a much more narrow and uh, constricted life. Uh, what he bought by breaking away was his freedom, the freedom to individuate, to think for himself, and really to follow in a unique uh, a unique path in his own direction. And so we could say this is the change from the first half of life to the second, if all goes well, that the ego is relativized in favor of the self. Now, what about on a cultural level? Um, if we take it, uh, take the fairy tale to be speaking not only of individuals, but also of the culture at large. Well, um, we could say that this uh, would signify a new spiritual attitude emerging and replacing a worn out religious tradition. Um, Jung felt that the um, uh, religious traditions in the West uh, were more or less uh, moribund, more or less, if not dead, uh, dying. Uh, and he looked around himself at the Protestant uh, Reformed Protestant tradition in Switzerland, and he didn't see much hope or life there or future. Where is it going to go? Catholic Church, same thing. Um, so many times in his lectures and in his writings, he would say, in the West, we are spiritually poverty stricken. We have no spirituality anymore. We have to go into our depths and find a new spiritual attitude that can take us forward into the future. Uh, the old forms um, don't work anymore. Uh, and the new the wine needs new bottles, as he said somewhere. I wrote a, a book about this called Minding the Self, um, in which I quote that sentence from Jung. New, it's in a letter that he writes to Victor White, the uh, Roman Catholic priest that he was in contact with for some time and had a, had a very lively correspondence and interaction with. Um, but what is the new uh, bottle then? What is the new form? What is the new container? Um, the old container was the church and the church's doctrines. And the new container has to be able to uh, withstand the pressures of Mercurius and uh, a, a very demanding and uh, energized unconscious. And I think Jung felt uh, that if he could do anything of value for the future, it would be to create or help to create a vessel to contain the spirit of individuation and the spirit of the unconscious. And his psychological theory was designed to do that some people claim he was trying to found a new religion. That isn't the case, uh, not in any standard view of what a religion is or a cult, but I think he was addressing the problem of Votan loose in the world. The spirit Mercurius has gotten out of the bottle. We don't have containers for the psyche. And when it's rampant and all over the place, we get a kind of cultural chaos, uh, relativism and um, disorientation and um, people going in all directions, not knowing why they're going there. Um, so the containment uh, that's offered by analytical psychology um, provides uh, some guidance as to uh, how to manage uh, energies, psychic energies on a personal level and on a, a cultural or a global level. And um, so uh, we, we are doing our best as Jungian analysts to try to work with individuals and now in recent years also with cultures and uh, groups of people, larger groups of people addressing cultural issues. I recently uh, 
co-edited a book with Regina Gaudaiti, a colleague from Lithuania called Facing Cultural, Confronting Cultural Trauma. Uh, and this is an attempt to address the aftermath of cultural traumas in various countries of the world, and various cultures. And uh, trauma uh, can uh, instigate and unleash a tremendous amount of uh, energy bent on revenge, very angry, Votanic-like. Um, and uh, this is more or less what happened after the First World War in Germany, that uh, Votan got loose, revenge was the order of the day, and uh, uh, really took over a whole collective and uh, drove it uh, to uh, its own destruction. And that's what we would like to avoid in the future. So um, maybe we can use uh, Jung's fairy tale and his very strong cautionary words uh, in his interpretation of um, the spirit in the bottle to um, also to make our way forward and to offer some guidance to our um, what we have today as a global culture. Um, not an easy task, but um, I think we have very talented people at the same time in engaged in this work and in this process. And I'm not without uh, some hope that we can possibly make a difference. Thank you very much. That will be the conclusion of uh, the uh, second seminar on the interpretation of fairy tales. Um, I hope you will join us for the third, where I will look at Erich Neumann's um, interpretation of a classic story, fairy tale from antiquity, um, Amor and Psyche, and uh, what uh, he does with that, how he interprets it and brings it into modern culture and shows its relevance for uh, individuation and development uh, for our times. So I'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Murray. Um, another excellent webinar. <laughs> Thank you so much, Murray. Another excellent webinar. And we're very excited for the next one. <clears throat> um, so until next uh, time, I believe that's on November 1st, about uh, three weeks from now. So we'll see everyone then. Um, Murray, have a nice rest of your weekend, and everybody else, we'll see you very soon. Thank you.